Face to Face is back. Nexus final to the front, and Florida Man tells his side. From the front, back, and sideways, I'm David Hood of the Diplomacy Broadcast Network, and this is Deadline, DBN's monthly news program. Dateline, June 2021. For our feature story, it was almost exactly one year ago that we started playing diplomacy in a whole new way, virtual face-to-face. -face. Confronted with the reality of COVID canceling our face-to-face -face events, this new medium was created to give us the immediacy of playing in person without having to actually be in the same physical location. This led to the growth of increased diplomacy play on Discord, some new diplomacy media content on YouTube and other places, and a flowering of our hobby in general. What lessons can we learn from the past 12 months of virtual face-to-face? -face? And what is the future for that aspect of our sport? Later in this program, we'll discuss this issue with a panel of hobbyists experienced in virtual play. But first, a look at headlines from around the world of diplomacy. Our friends in Europe are back to holding their European DIPCON face-to-face -face for 2021. This 29th annual Continental Championship will be held August 27th through 29th at the Palace Hotel in Saraville in conjunction with the San Marino Game Convention, which is a larger board games event. There will be four rounds of diplomacy over three days, including a top board, and it will be scored using the Italia 2010 system. Also coming up on the European tour is the Anjou Fire to be held in Champs-sur-Léon on July 10th and 11th. More information on both of these events can be found in the Diplomacy of the Board Game Europe group on Facebook. Look for the links below in the description field for both the Facebook group and for the Anjou Fire specifically. In addition to these two upcoming events in Europe, let's talk about some tournament action in North America as well. The 35th annual DixieCon was held virtually on Discord over Memorial Day weekend, May 28th through 30th. Karthik Conneth of California took home the gold, just edging out silver winner Ed Sullivan of Texas. Johnny Gillum from Washington State scored the bronze. Hollins Klaus de Graff won the first ever speedboat tournament at DixieCon, while the Player's Choice Award went to Robert Schoop from Germany. Full coverage of the event can be found on the DBN YouTube channel, and full results are also available at www.dixiecon.com. The next virtual face-to-face -face tournament is the Boston Massacre, hosted by Alex Maslow this year over the weekend of June 26th and 27th. For more information on this three-round event to be held on the VWDC Discord server, check out the link in the description field below this broadcast. Diplomacy can be brutal in person, says one contributor to gaming website Dicebreaker.com. But Johnny Chiodini discovered during the pandemic that playing online reduced their stress level from when they had attempted to play face-to-face -face with their friends. As described in the column, playing the game on Backstabber gave Johnny more time to consider their options, more chances to draft their diplomatic language more persuasively, and more emotional cover for the backstabs and lies which are part of the game when played most competitively. We all know that the anonymity and lack of real connection between actors on the internet can be a dangerous thing with respect to maintaining decorum and amity online. But maybe that separation between folk really is necessary for some players to play diplomacy in a more satisfying fashion. See if you agree with Johnny's thesis. The link to that article is listed below. Both the Virtual Diplomacy League and the Tour of Britain have already played league games in June, with the VDL hosting three games on June 5th and the Tour featuring two games each on June 12th and 13th. Going into these two weekends of play, Britain's Michaelis Camarites was leading the standings of both leagues. That's still true in the VDL, where his solo earlier in the season still has him anchored in the top spot with Morgante Pell of Vermont 
and Ben Kelman of Pennsylvania rounding out the top three. But in the tour, Pell himself now leads the pack after impressive top and shared top results in rounds three and four this past weekend. DBN's league night coverage on June 5th covered the VDL games that day in really some detail. So check out that video on our YouTube page. As for the Tour of Britain games, they will be analyzed on the upcoming July edition of League Night. Suffice it to say, we get a mixed bag. Some solo tops, some shared tops, and some really shared tops with three-way ties at games in. <clears throat> Both of these leagues were played on the VWDC Discord server, and current standings for the VDL are also available at www.diplobn.com. You too can join the fun with the Tour of Britain resuming September 11th and 12th and the next VDL game day coming up on July 10th. To go along with all that virtual league action, there have also been live face-to-face -face play and virtual games in local hobbies over the past several weeks and months. The Minnesota Diplomacy Club played outdoors back in April, which I am sure involved some pretty thick coats. On May 22nd, the Denver area group Armada held an indoor game, which ended in a five-way draw after six and a half hours. It combined old Armada faces along with new Colorado blood as that club begins its renaissance after several years of inactivity. Longtime hobbyists will remember that club as the host of the 2001 Dipcon and the 2003 World Dipcon. And then the Nashvillains of Nashville, Tennessee, just completed their first season of club play. They scored four, best four out of six virtual games played overall. And based on those scores, Kirk Vaughn is at the top of the standings, followed by Amy Kawabata and Steven Skioshia. No recent games to report from your local area? Then why not you be the organizer? Visit the North American Diplomacy Federation website for links to hobby resources to help you promote your own local diplomacy play. The Diplomacy Broadcast Network is not the only provider of diplomacy-themed content out there. So on Deadline, we'd like to tell you about some of the wonderful programming you can access from what we call our DBN Media Partners. Links to each of them are listed on the NADF website media page at thenadf.org. In the past month, we have Diplo Strats doing over four hours of commentary about a game of the 34-player variant Chaos, which was played some time ago on V Diplomacy. And then Pro a Florida Man, who's been very prolific in the past month, dropping a number of new episodes on his YouTube channel, including a handy primer on getting started in online play, as well as an episode on the etiquette, ethics, and ethos of diplomacy. The Diplomacy Briefing newsletter continues to churn out amazing content every Friday. In one recent edition, we have a video from Russ Dennis about his visit to the Diplomacy Zine Archive housed at Bowling Green State University. We'll feature more about his zine history project in next month's edition of Deadline News. Another of our DBN media partners has begun in-depth coverage of the season six finals of the Nexus Extended Deadline Full Press Online Tournament. The Diplomats podcast, hosted by Ed Sullivan, who's known as Go Horns Go Online, released episodes covering the power selection for the finals and interviews with each of the seven finalists on this top board. Longtime viewers of DBN will recognize many of these names, although not all of them. Riaz Varani of British Columbia is playing England. Philip from D.C. is France. Dave Roberts of Washington State is Germany. Sergey, also known as Max Vax from New York, is Italy. Ewok, also from British Columbia, is playing the Russian. Italian Pez de Mer is playing Austria, and German resident Tangian is the Turk. You can catch coverage of this prestigious online diplomacy event at the Diplomats YouTube channel. And now, let's debut a new feature on Deadline, which is called My Favorite 
things. We'll interview a diplomacy player about why that person likes playing a particular power or alliance on the board. And then we'll talk about something of particular interest to that hobbyist, whether or not related to diplomacy. We're going to start with someone you may well recognize because he shares the exact same DNA with some other fellow. Okay, viewers of Deadline News on DBN, look what the cat has drug in, proverbially. We've got welcoming to the show uh, some guy named John Hood. John, you play diplomacy, right? Um, I, I certainly have. Okay. Uh, I played lots of games of diplomacy. Of course, this was also uh, during the pre-internet age. So I have played a few games of diplomacy since, but a lot of my experience of diplomacy is when we were young. Well, for, the, for those that may be wondering, how did you slash we start playing diplomacy in 1984? Well, our gateway drug was risk. As for many board gamers, we played a lot of risk. And then we realized this is getting boring. And after all, we're just rolling a lot of dice. So we tried to come up with an alternative game to, for our circle to play. And one of our friends, Frank Tate, his father uh, had had a game called Diplomacy, which we understood did not involve rolling dice, which was attractive. But then we discovered that that game was unavailable. We couldn't find it. So we ended up buying a copy of the game and a copy of the guide, the gamer's guide, at the same time and started playing Diplomacy. And I guess a lot of us are still playing Diplomacy. Certainly some of us are. So do you recognize the artwork behind me here with respect to that gamer's guide we were talking about? <laughs> well, it's from that. It's depicting the various uh, leaders of the seven powers. Uh, the one that I'm always drawn to is the uh, is Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary, because that's the, that's the power. I think I played for the first time, and it was always my first love. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, why, why Austria? Why Austria-Hungary in diplomacy? Why would you care about playing that power? Well, I, I would cheekily say because nobody else wanted to, but that's not really true because I actually was drawn to the power. It's right in the center of the board. And my view about this game, maybe because of our impatience playing Risk so many times, was I, I wanted to go big or go home. Uh, we know that Austria has a lot of enemies at first, and if it can survive being uh, surrounded by all these potential enemies and actually work its way to a significant power uh, it, around the mid game, then it is actually difficult to stop. So I, I like the idea of playing Austria where you either figure out pretty early, you're not really going to be a factor in the game or you're a major factor in the game. That's at least well, I'm going to let our viewers figure out whether you often went big or often went home. <laughs> you went home a lot. <laughs> all right. So, uh, I also wanted to get you on the show. We're all, we're going to do a, a we're doing a series of interviews about people's favorite powers, and you are the one who liked to play Austria a lot. And did you become uh, synonymous with Austria like a nickname? Well, absolutely. A lot of our circle of friends and diplomacy players started to call me Uncle Franz. Of course, that's a reference to the way that the Habsburgs were related to everybody else uh, in Europe. But also it was my approach to the game, which was uh, Austria, while it can be aggressive at first, it needs to be talking to everybody a lot and not just the obvious suspects of Italy, Turkey and Russia. In particular, my experience, I don't know if this is still true in the hobby today, but my experience was that England was very important in the long run for Austria and in the medium term, Germany is important. You, you don't necessarily, there aren't a whole lot of ways to actively work together uh, but you certainly shouldn't work at cross purposes. And that's historically accurate, isn't it? Yeah, there's there's a big, there has been a debate in the hobby between those who believe in the Anschluss theory, yeah. that Austria and Germany need to stay together a lot, and those who believe that actually in the mid game, you have to attack each other to get to a position to possibly win. There's a debate about that. Well, naturally, the Anschluss should happen on Austria's terms, not Germany's terms. Germany should be doing your bidding, not the other way around. Typical from an Austro-centric player like Uncle Franz, John Hood. Well, tell us what you do besides occasionally playing diplomacy and other board games. What, what do you do in real life? Well, most of my career was spent, is spent as a political commentator, author, newspaper columnist, 
in North Carolina and to some extent around the country, the writing that I do on public policy and politics. Most recently, though, I, I had written seven nonfiction books and my wife basically said no more books. And she stuck to this rule for many years. And then I had this, I got sick one time and had a sort of a crazy notion about Daniel Boone hunting a giant wampus cat on a mountain with a fairy companion and wrote that up as a story. She liked it. She came into the room and said, where's chapter two? And so therefore I was writing a novel and I have written this novel. It's called Mountain Folk. It's set primarily during the American Revolution. And as you might have guessed by my description, it's a historical fantasy novel. That means Daniel Boone is a major character. George Washington is a major character. A number of other historical personalities are central to the story. But there's also winged fairies and dwarves and elves and pixies and a giant sea monster and a fire breathing salamander. You know, it's, it's that kind of book. You, you, you're familiar with that kind of book, right? I don't believe anybody is familiar, but they ought to become familiar with your book. And if they want to do that, how would they do that? Well, the easiest way to find out more about Mountain Folk is to go to mountainfolkbook.com. I've got a lot of material there, ways to learn more about the book, shopping opportunities on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, local bookstores, etc. Character sketches, themes, maps of the Mountain Folk world and even a 10 part video series that goes into the world of mountain folk in some detail. People may enjoy watching that even if they never read the book. But of course, go, go order the book and read it as well. Of course, I mean, that goes without saying, I guess I should have said it though. Well, I, I'm always cleaning up behind you, so I'm doing it. You know, but my strategy for Uncle Franz was always to be helpful, to provide options, to give advice uh, that gently but firmly led them uh, to the slaughter. So that is, that's probably not a very good analogy for buying my book, which is a good thing. But after all, if you're playing diplomacy and you're Austria and you get a win, that's also a good thing. Well, to bring this back to diplomacy a minute, what I'm hearing from your story is you were told no by the powers that be. You figured out a way to make it a yes. Uh, I deny all knowledge of the veracity of that theory. That's exactly, you expect. exactly what I thought. Well, any final words for our diplomacy audience? Uh, about well, one of the themes of, of mountain folk that diplomacy players will particularly enjoy is, in fact, the jockeying for position across the North American continent that I described. Not just the real life uh, conflict when the American colonies revolted against Britain and there were questions about France and Spain and Indian tribes, Native Americans in, on the frontier. That's depicted in the book. But also I have fairy nations that are also in America and they're going for or against the American Revolution. So actually a lot of mountain folk involves diplomacy, quite literally. And as I recall, there, there is a fair amount of diplomatic interchange or at least negotiation interchange among the dwarves themselves. That's right. Uh, the, the, there is not a lot of a, there is, in fact, a scene where a bunch of dwarf lords in Germany are debating back and forth. Uh, you're invading my territory. Uh, this this actually could have been, with very few modifications, a description of a diplomacy game. I am going to let the viewers think about and possibly tell me later which diplomacy hobby personalities should play each of the characters in that scene, because I guarantee you there's one that fits every one of them. Absolutely. Different, different dwarf nations in the novel have different personalities, different strengths, and the leaders have very strong personalities that you could probably connect with folks in your own in your own circle. All right. Well, thank you, whatever your name is, for being on the show. And uh, hopefully everyone will go look at mountainfolkbook.com and get more information. Thank you very much. It's now been roughly one year since the concept of playing virtual face-to-face -face diplomacy was born. So it's time to take stock of where we are where we've been, and where we're going with virtual face-to-face -face as a mode of play. To discuss this, we have a panel of virtual face-to-face -face analysts from the Diplomacy Broadcast Network itself, Brandon Fogel in Illinois, and then Karthik Conniff and Adam Silverman, both in California. Welcome to Deadline, fellas, and let's talk about this whole virtual face-to-face -face business, shall we? Starting with you, Brandon. 
since you are one of the founders of DBN, would there even be a network like DBN without virtual face-to-face? -face? And, and what do you think that has meant for the hobby? Well, first of all, David, let me thank you for having me on Deadline News. It's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, the short answer is no, there wouldn't be no DBN uh, without virtual. We only started playing virtually because of the pandemic. As far as I know, nobody um, before that was doing any sort of online coverage with, um, with in-person face-to-face stuff. And uh, so once we went virtual, when the pandemic started, um, there were people who like who had YouTube channels who liked to sort of do some streaming. And um, I got caught up with one of them, and then we started doing it for Windy City Weasels. And then uh, I got uh, Siobhan Nolan and Chris Martin involved, and the quality improved because they are really good at this. And uh, and then we did DixieCon last year, and uh, we took it away from there. Uh, as far as what's it meant for the hobby, um, you know, for for starters. Uh, virtual has kept the hobby going. Um, and that was something that it, it's worth taking a, no, a moment to reflect on how remarkable that is, because this is a game that we like to play with each other in person. We all knew each other from playing in person. And we've managed to keep that going uh, for a year and a half during which uh, playing in person was impossible. Um, so the, this community that we built together is still a community because of virtual face to face. Um, and on top of that, it, uh, you know, it's, it provides this other avenue. So it's brought in a lot of people who haven't played Diplomacy before. It's introduced the game and expanded the potential pool for future participants. So there's a lot of room for future expansion of the hobby thanks to the virtual game. And another thing that it has done is allow us to connect with longtime players who are just playing online, like Karthik Conniff, who mm -hmm. is the next person I want to talk about. First of all, congratulations for winning DixieCon a couple of weeks ago, the virtual version of DixieCon. Thank you. You started in the virtual diplomacy space, uh, you know, last year as a player rather than as an organizer or a broadcaster. So give us that player's perspective on the emergence of this new mode of play, virtual face-to-face. -face. Sure. So I started playing online in terms of like extended deadline play on web diplomacy around 10 years ago. Um, had never really gotten into the face-to-face -face community um, before for various reasons. Um, but virtual face-to-face -face gave me an option to try it out at zero cost. And it proved to be really, really fun. Um, I uh, did my first one at Liberty, had a great time. And then ever since then, been playing in BDL, uh, DixieCon, and a bunch of other tournaments. So it's been really, really good. Um, and the move to virtual has definitely allowed a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't get into the face-to-face -face hobby to, like, you know, meet the stars of the hobby and them. Yeah, that that's really one of the one of the cool things has been the connections that have been fostered in the last twelve months. Uh, mm -hmm. Adam, you've been a player, you've been an organizer in the diplomacy hobby for many years. So, I would value your insights on virtual face to face as it relates to the state of the hobby before virtual play was a thing. How do you think virtual face to face has has altered the landscape if it has? Uh, well, I, I think it's definitely has in, in many ways, and I think they're all positive. Um, you know, just the new connections that have been made and the scope of new players and new play styles that we've gotten the opportunity to experience as a result of virtual face-to-face -face diplomacy has really just broadened, I think, the, uh, the community, right? I mean, um, we have players who have never played before, as you pointed out. We have players who are predominantly played extended deadline email games before. We have players who mostly play speedboat or gumboat diplomacy, and they're jumping into the virtual face-to-face -face and bringing all kinds of different play styles. We see different types of trends, different openings, different mid-game play, different uh, structures of alliances than we that we have seen in face-to-face uh, -face for a long time, a whole new meta that you like to talk about. Um, you know, things changing. So that's been wonderful for the game, right? And just to expand the group of players. And frankly, the quality of play has just been phenomenal, right? And and you go from in face-to-face -face where people are traveling around, but it's a small core group of people who are going to most of these. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a segment of elite players, but that has been vastly, uh, vastly extended thanks to, thanks to virtual face-to-face. 
Um, the other thing that I would highlight is just the level of connection it's provided people within the hobby and, you know, the opportunity to connect with really interesting, great people from around the world uh, in ways that, that we never would have done uh, without this. Yeah, I think that's totally true. Karthik, going back to you for a minute, how has the actual experience of playing virtual face-to-face -face games changed since we started doing it last summer, either you know, change for the good or change not for the not so good. Tell us if, if there have been changes. Uh, I definitely would say it's changed for the better in a lot of ways. Um, I think as we got used to for, uh, virtual face to face, there's been fewer, fewer fewer hiccups. Everything has gotten a lot smoother in terms of people getting acquainted with Discord, people getting acquainted with Backstabber, um, people getting acquainted with uh, new interfaces, and also like as a uh, Adam and Brandon mentioned, we brought a lot of new players into the hobby um, from extended deadline world from the just completely never played diplomacy world um and from the uh speedo world so uh that's led to a lot of evolution in the meta we've seen a lot of new play styles uh people trying willing to like you know play new alliances um and i think that's been very very good overall like you know in terms of creating sort of dynamism in the hobby yeah that's that's really right so brandon going back to you for a minute about on the broadcast end of things um Tell us how the coverage of face-to-face -face play and leagues and tournaments and stuff has developed over time, over this 12 months, both technically and stylistically. I think one of the features of the early development uh, was uh, professionalization. Uh, you know, when we first got on the air, we kind of like, we just, we called it like we saw it, like as if we were in person hanging out. Uh, and so there was a lot of criticism. Like there was a natural tendency to say what we would have done in that situation. You know, granted, with like hindsight, with the power of hindsight, and also um, uh, just a lot of sort of time and relaxed atmosphere to think about it. So we were much more critical in the beginning. I think we, we sort of figured out relatively early that that um, that, that wasn't great TV. Um, but the, the better parts were when we were uh, finding ways to understand what the people were doing and offer suggestions to beginners or for people who were learning how to play on on what to do. So that, there's kind of professionalization that happened, I think, um, uh, in the early going. Uh, the other big thing that I can think of is that we learned how to cover a lot of material quickly. So the early broadcasts, we had we would have one per round, so a tournament could have, you know, 12 or 14 hours of coverage. Um, and uh, we, so we, we, we've condensed that now. We have usually have one round per coverage where we cover the earlier rounds in more condensed fashion. Still learning how to do that effectively, but I think we've come a long way. Um, and uh, the big innovation recently has been uh, coming from Brian Cravel and League Night. So he's, Brian and the other people on the League Night team have developed uh, a way of uh, covering all of the sort of longer term competitions like BDL and Tour of Britain and the uh, the French uh, the French League as well. And also there's recently started covering the Speedboat League. Um, and uh, and that's been fun to watch. Brian is really putting a lot of effort into uh, coming up with new ways of presenting the material uh, and especially new ways of analyzing the play that's been going on so far. And so we've got, we now have a stats team headed by uh, Wes Ketchum and uh, we have a very active group that uh, that is coming up with lots of good ideas for how to describe play analytically. Uh, and I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. I know the, the first flush that players have had with it over the last two league nights have been really well received. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of like a, an immediate future for the uh, broadcast analysis side. Yeah, it's exciting. I, I, would, I would agree with that entirely. Uh, Adam, let's talk just about organizing tournaments a minute. You know, many face-to-face -face events have, have turned into a virtual event in the last 12 months. You just finished running one of them, the whipping tournament that's usually in uh, the Bay Area of California. You were in, you, you basically ran the virtual event. So, you know, speaking of innovation, tell us a little bit about how that experience compared to running the event strictly as a face-to-face -face tournament. Well, I think in a lot of ways, thanks to the hard work of the people who have sort of set up the systems, um, running a virtual face-to-face -face tournament has gotten to be fairly straightforward actually. And, you know, the, the infrastructure is in place to do it. The uh, technology is in place to do it. Thanks to, 
you know, Chris Brand software for tournament tracking and, and board placement. Thanks to uh, Zach's work on setting up the Discord and Bill Hackenbrack's work together, setting up the Discord servers uh, in a way that is uh, logical, in a way that is easy to navigate. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, um, the logistics have gotten uh, much easier over the past year. I, I don't want to think about what things were like a year ago when the first couple of these were run, but um, and, and, and thankfully I, I wasn't involved then. And but but it's really just been amazing uh, from a technology standpoint that this system is really well streamlined. Um, from a from a player recruiting standpoint, um, it's a bit different actually. Uh, recruiting for a virtual event, trying to get players to sign up and, and jump in versus a face-to-face um, uh, -face event. Um, in some ways, you have the benefit, of course, of being able to reach an audience around the world and get players from multiple continents, from all over the United States and Europe and, and Australia and elsewhere um, who want to play and are willing to uh, deal with whatever time zone it is and just jump into games uh, because they don't have to travel, they don't have to take time off to get on a plane and, and stay in the Bay Area. Um, you know, of course, the, with, with that, the flip side is we don't have the benefit of having that time together, which I think is so meaningful for, for many of us in the hobby, um, really having that direct interaction both during the games uh, and after the games. Um, but we've been trying to innovate ways to do that as well. Uh, it's still not the same as getting together face to face, but we did a, um, uh, a pre-game happy hour at the Whipping, which we got a fairly decent attendance to um, where, you know, we had 20 or 30 players um, just hanging out on a Zoom, you know, having some drinks and, and bantering about their games and about life and about what whatnot. Um, and the other part is, you know, the, the Discord uh, space offers an opportunity for people to continuously have conversations both about diplomacy and about other aspects of sports and life and music and whatever else interests them. And it is a way to make connections that I really just didn't think was possible. Um, but we've seen so much of that over the last year and made so many connections personally and for me, and I'm sure everyone else in the, in this room has done so as well. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, we haven't been able to keep everybody involved. I mean, one thing that's going to be good about resumption of face to face is we have some people that have tried virtual face to face and simply didn't like it. It is not for everybody. And so, the, but the question, and I'll, Adam, I'll stay with you uh, with this question. Let's talk about the future of virtual face-to-face -face because some folks are going to just go back to playing face-to-face. -face. So what, how do you see virtual FTF fitting into the overall picture of diplomacy play in the future, you know, as a, as a part of the hobby alongside the online extended deadline play and the actual face-to-face uh, tournaments that will resume? I, I think it's here to stay. I mean, it's going to be here in some form. It's just been too big a boon to the hobby and too many people enjoy it for it to just disappear once we go back to face-to-face. -to -face. I think, um, you know, wh whether every tournament is doing a virtual uh, event in parallel to their live events, I, I kind of doubt that's going to continue. But I do think that we're going to see plenty of, you know, we're going to see the VDL continue. We're going to see, um, you know, virtual tournaments continue to some extent over the oncoming years. It's easy for people to participate and people really enjoy it and it brings them together. And I think as an organizer, um, I'm keen on continuing that much as I'm keen on bringing back face-to-face -face whipping. I'm, I'm keen on seeing virtual events continue. And, and if that's going to entail, you know, different ways of looking at things once we can do both, uh, that's fine. I think there's a place for all of it. How about you, Brandon? What, what future do you see for virtual play as it relates not only to the hobby as a whole, but also to, you know, video content through DBN and other content creators? I, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll reformat your question a little bit if you don't mind. I, the big question for us at DBN is what happens when in-person play resumes as far as our coverage goes. We'll always be able to cover the virtual stuff. And I, I, I agree with Adam that I think the virtual game is here to stay. It, it's the barrier for entry is so low and the ability to reach people all over the world is, is too tempting um, for, uh, for it to go away. 
I, I, as far as DBN and in-person goes, you know, we've, we've tossed out lots of ideas over the past year as to how we could cover in-person events. And, um, you know, different people have different ideas about how to do it and about how effective it'll be. I'm actually kind of bullish on the idea. I, I think that uh, I've, I've, I've found some uh, cameras that we might be able to send around to different tournaments and uh, maybe have some remote uh, uh, order order writers putting in orders into a system that we can then use to broadcast. Um, I, you know, I, the question is whether that'll make good TV and whether people will be interested. Uh, I, I tend to think that they will be, um, and I'm excited to give it a shot. I, uh, you know, so whenever the first event happens, whether it's Carnage later this year or uh, or something next year, uh, we're 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 there to give it a shot. Uh, but I'm. You know, it, the, the, there has been a little bit of drop off in interest in the virtual events recently, and I, I, I assume that's because people are uh, having f more freedom to be able to go out and do other stuff, and they're excited to do that, excited to get out of the house. Um, and uh, I, but I think they'll, I think a lot of them will come back, and I think we'll get more people with virtual. So I think it's here to stay. And I, you know, hopefully we'll be celebrating a fifth year uh, anniversary of DBN at some point in the future with uh, with something special. I can't wait for that. Karthik, again, from an active player's point of view, are there aspects of virtual face-to-face -face which you think will help it continue to grow and develop as the world does get back to normal? Uh, you know, is, is there something attractive about it that you think will continue to? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, sure. Um, so I think the fact, um, as Brandon mentioned, that you can play with anyone around the world um, is going to be an incredibly compelling uh, reason to continue playing virtual face-to-face. Um, that allows you to play with people around the world who have different perspectives on how the game should be played, have different strategies, different metas, and allows that sort of like, you know, that fluidity, which really makes diplomacy uh, fun and keeps from getting stale. Uh, so I think from that perspective, there's going to be reason to play. Second, as Brandon also mentioned, is the low like barrier of entry, low cost. Um, for a lot of people who are transitioning from online play to virtual face-to-face, -face, um, the fact that there is no barrier to entry is huge. I mean, it was huge for me. One of the main reasons why I was able to get into the game in the first place. Um, so I think that's another reason why people will continue to put them on and uh, people will continue to put them out. I will we'll continue to go to them because there's no reason not to at the end of time. That makes sense. Well, uh, virtual face-to-face, -face, I would say, is basically the newest kid on the diplomacy block. So Adam... Final thoughts, thought, final thoughts for our audience about that newest kid and how that kid's going to grow up here. Well, I think we're going to have to wait and see. It's evolved a lot, actually, over the last year with new innovations, the, you know, the, the DBN evolution, the um, evolution of VDL, the way tournaments have been run and structured. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see some of that, and especially the big inflection is going to be I think probably towards the end of this year into early next year when the face-to-face -face events come back and the organizers like myself and, and you, David, and others are trying to find ways to integrate all of these different forms. I think it's going to be exciting because I think we're going to see people playing in multiple contexts. We're going to see in person many of the great Fit Pete names that we've seen uh, it virtually only. We're going to start meeting them at, at these face-to-face -face events and we're going to continue to see them kicking butt in virtual diplomacy. So I, I'm, I'm super excited about it. Sure. Car Karthik, what about you? Final thoughts for our audience about the past, present, or future of the uh, virtual play? Uh, yeah, I mean, the past year, uh, virtual face, face has been fantastic. Um, I think we'll have another great year ahead of us with all of the, uh, the summer and winter classic events that Bill's putting on, with uh, the VDL especially, which, I mean, is just such a beautiful like format, just an extended league. You can't beat that, and it's very hard to do in person, and it's very easy to do virtually. Um, so I think that's just going to be super attractive. And yeah, I'm also excited to have face to face return. Being able to do both is really the best of both worlds. So here's to uh, DixieCon in person. Here's Gotta to get it. my title there. That's right. You'll be the defending champ next May. All right, Brandon, take us home on this subject. Virtual face to face after 12 months. Go. Uh, you know, I'm with uh, both of these guys that I, I I look forward to seeing the two worlds merge. So, like, I want to see a board with uh, in person with Ed Sullivan and John Anderson and Tanya Gill all together. Uh, and I want to be there when it happens, uh, hopefully with a camera in their faces all the time. 
Um, I, so yeah, I, it's uh, virtual has been really, it's been a great way for all of us to get through the pandemic. Um, and I think that the coverage has provided more entertainment than we might have expected. Uh, and also, you, you know, we all like a little bit of attention. Uh, I think diplomacy players, there's a lot of things they have in common. Uh, one are these analytical abilities. Another is uh, a, a, a great tolerance for uh, social manipulation. But the other is we all kind of like attention. We all like to be a little bit in the spotlight. And so I think, uh, I think DBN's been nice for that. Uh, the other thing it's been great for has been uh, providing us with the Walter Cronkite of the diplomacy world, uh, otherwise known as David Hood. So David, uh, I want to thank you for a year of deadline news. Um, and I look forward to the uh, the 12th episode. I, this isn't going to be it, right? We got one more after this? Uh, I don't. This might be the 12th one because we'll the first one was in July. Uh, so I think this might be the 12th episode. All right. Happy birthday, uh, Deadline News and David Hood. Well, thanks for that. And thanks to all of you guys for being on the show. Thank you, David. Thanks, thank you, David. And thanks to all of you watching at home. We hope you have enjoyed this broadcast of Deadline. If you have news, ideas for features, or feedback of any kind, please feel free to send an email to info at diplobn.com or you can drop me a line directly at davidhood at dixiecon.com. For all of our other broadcast offerings, visit our website at diplobn.com. This is David Hood signing off. I wish you brightness and bliss and, of course, Belgium. <laughs>